People first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want purpose driven work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello and welcome back. This is Sri Chalapa with People Strategy Leaders Podcast. And today I have the honor of Greg, uh, having Greg Ballard, who's a founder and CEO of 5C Consulting, a boutique firm based in Washington, D.C. Metro. His company works with a diverse set of clients, ranging from mid-sized tech companies, large government agencies, military and nonprofits, to radically improve strategic people investments and organizational performance. With over 20 years of experience, Greg has developed extensive experience in management and leadership development through startup, corporate, entrepreneurial, and faith-based enterprises. In prior roles, Greg has led and managed business units of 300 plus and has personally mentored over 225 leaders. Greg has facilitated 300 plus classroom workshop experiences and organized or supported over 1400 large event experiences. So Greg, obviously you have a lot of experiences. Thank you so much for being on my show. I am really excited to uh, talk to you and get some of your wisdom to share with my audience. Uh, Sri, thank you so much. It's, it's just a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So Greg, when we were talking earlier, you, know, you mentioned um, some of the things that you know, we talk a lot in HR, in our people management space, uh, in general, also in, in other uh, areas, right? The concept of best practices. Um, so you have a you have a very interesting take on best practices. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a little bit of a um, soapbox I like to get on and challenge people. So best practices uh, for me may not be best practices for you. And a lot of times we don't think about um, a best practice. We may hear about it, read about it, and and just kind of assume a cut and paste will apply, right? Uh, but we'll really need to think about with best practices. And this is this is for HR and people as well as any other division or department. Because um, if you step back and you think, well, this best practice was designed in a specific environment, right? And in that environment, um, those people had a very specific mission. Uh, they had very clear strengths and weaknesses. Um, and they were they were performing in a very specific market. And they had a very a specific strategic uh, agenda that they wanted to reach. And they with all it, it, they were informed by all of those things, and then they developed a set of best practices. Well, if I take the best practices of company XYZ that is in a market, um, and uh, and I, I'm not pulling an example, I'm just being very conceptual here, and, I, and, and they're trying to do their thing, and they, they know their own strengths and their own competitive advantage, right? And they want to leverage that competitive advantage. Well, if I take their best practice and I bring it over to my company, my team, well, I don't have the same competitive advantages they do. I'm probably not in the same market that they, they're in. I don't have exactly the same talent and resources that they do. How come their best practice is going to be my best practice? Mm -hmm. Now, it could be, but if we don't take the time to actually think it through, it's more likely than not that cutting and pasting best practices from other organizations is likely not going to be a best practice for us. Yeah. And one great example that I can think of, you know, in general, there's the best practice that you should not try monetary rewards to performance. Um, you know, if you want to, let's say every time you hit a goal, you get a, you get a, a, a bonus or a cash reward. And eventually that starts to dissipate its impact. And so a lot of companies can, you know, rightly so, I believe, that don't want to do that. They're like, that's part of your job and your satisfaction is in doing the job and achieving your goals. But if you do the same thing to your, to your sales team, they're going to get demotivated, you know? And oh, so the best practice yes. for, for what might be your, uh, you know, for your ops team uh, might not be the best practice for your sales team, right? And I think that's very important to keep in, you know, the human psychology of different work 
and different organizations with different teams in, in consideration. So um, that's the one I can think about. Is that a, a good example in your mind? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. So another one would be, um, you know, in customer service, we might re re reward or incentivize speed and turnaround, right? In customer service, like like quick, take care of your customer, take care of the client, do it quickly, get them at, get it at, get it, get them back and on track, right? But you're not, and so you may have time sensitive, time time um, based incentives in your customer service, but you're not going to do that in your engineering department, right? Right. <laughs> because you're not about you don't want your engineers. You're not trying to drive them to get it done more quickly. You want them to get it right. Right. Okay. So you're you're going to have a different incentive. And so that that's an example of the concept. So the whole whole idea of best practice and the language because it gets it gets rubber stamped on so many things, and I just I, I want to, you know, bring it up and say, hey, pause and think. Before you just go and, and adopt a, a set of best practices, think about it. Where are they coming from? Who designed them and for what reasons, right? And then when you understand where they came from, and what, then you can determine if they're going to apply to you and the situation you want to put them in. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So um, the other thing about best practices, you know, the one talking about best practices, you know, training for employees is considered a best practice, right? People want development. So let's put a training plan in place, right? So what's, oh, yeah. that? And what's going on in the world of our training that we are, people are doing right or not doing right about? So, so there's, there's two ways we look at training. So it's either it's a information transformation, like I'm going to convey it is content consumption, whether it's reading or watching or listening or participating and, and someone, you know, provides content it's information based and then after you've completed that whether it's again a video a workshop a, a, a live you know retreat whatever you get a check mark next to your name you've been trained the information has been conveyed and this can even follow up with a certification like okay we gave you a quiz so not only did you go and you enjoyed it like you gave it the smiley face but you um you you actually got tested and and you 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 demonstrated within probably maybe a, a few days or a few hours or maybe a week of completing this that you retain something. Well, the inherent flaw with that is most information is gone within 30 days. 90% of information is gone within 30 days. And in most cases dealing with people, we're not we, we're not the goal is not to pump them full of information but it's actually get new behavior right so exactly. it's actually getting to make a new decision in a in a situation to behave in a different way and some of the some of my background um a couple of things i did before i'm doing was doing this you know way back in my background i did two, two specific things that may be relevant in this regard one i ran a company that worked with adolescent kids and um, you know, parents, at-risk kids, uh, they kind of hit the emotional and physical limit to you know bringing their children into adulthood, and very difficult decisions for anybody all the way around. Uh, and so, whatever the situation was, they they actually would reach out to schools and programs that that would you know take their child and and kind of finish finish the journey, whether that's an emotional growth school, a wilderness treatment center. Um, or, or whatever was necessary. But then the ultimate challenge came in, how do I get my child from home to that school? Well, my company provided that service. We're one of a handful of groups around the country that would provide uh, what's called an escort, um, an, a, a juvenile escort service. And because we had to deal with kids physically, okay, we our training had to be behavioral. Uh, another, another role that I filled was um, uh, assets protection. So uh, think retail, think grocery, you go into a store, there's sometimes there's, there's people uh, looking at human behavior, looking at how people are behaving and looking for people that are potentially trying to shoplift. And then you engage them, you confront them, uh, and then you have to restrain them. So when I was being trained, the, uh, the, 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 ver the proverbial training that I got was, you are trained when, we beha when you behave the way we want you to behave. And so I have hardwired in, into me that training is a behavior, okay? Well, and, and, and that's not to make it light or anything like that, but if you go, if you're in a martial arts, so I'm, I'm, I'm studying martial arts, we train behavior. 
we train behavior. So there's those two different categories. Do we want to have training that is based on information or do we want to be train a, uh, information, uh, train with an outcome of behavior? And that behavior can be really anything. It doesn't have to be physical, right? It doesn't have to be, um, you know, how to take somebody down or restrain them or, or, or self-defense. It can be, how do I train trust? trust? How do I train psychological safety? How do I train uh, compassion? How do I train for people to focus on productivity, to find productivity opportunities? How do we train safety behaviors? Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, if you're in, if you're in the uh, a manufacturing space, right? If you're in, um, you know, any space where there's high risk to people being harmed, safety is number one, and safety is always tied to behaviors. Like, how do you be? What what is the protocol? And so, that's how we look at it. Um, and we now have a capability. So behavior has been, you know, for a very long time considered a soft skill and soft because we can't measure it, you know, uh, quantitatively. And now today with technology, we actually have the capability of not only utilizing, um, you know, the, the research that shows what drives new behavior, um, but we have technology that allows us to uh, measure the impact of behavior and 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 being able to see where it's going at scale. So when we that's how we approach training. Everything we do is about behavioral implementation. Yes, yeah, so the behavioral implementation sounds <coughs> sounds interesting. You know, how do you measure my behavior change six months down the line? Um, are you suggesting maybe doing it like a 360 or are you suggesting there's some kind of uh, uh, assessment that you take? Like what are your I mean, that's a very interesting subject for me because I, I find it hard to really measure. It just, my gut tells me that person has changed, but I, I, I can't put my finger on exactly what, what that is. Yeah, so we look at it um, over, like right now, we, we would take most approaches in a, in a 30 day approach. So if we're gonna have a conversation on trust, okay? So what we'll do is we'll identify trust as a core. And the, the, our approach at uh, 5C is, everything we do, we connect it to strategy. So how do you connect strategy to behavior? So number one, if you want to um, build a, a more adaptive organization, okay? So an organization that is agile and resilient, that can pivot and move and, and withstand the changes within the market, which is what we do. We build adaptive teams, we create an adaptive culture. And so in order to do that, you're going, you say we go through a process, we identify your core, one of the core things that your organization work needs to work on in order to be adaptive is increased trust. Trust is really the foundation for everything, um, but if it already exists, we can work on other things. But say we just need to, we need to level up on that. So we identify trust as one of the core uh, behaviors uh, that needs to happen, core, um, uh, uh, yeah, core behaviors. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna slice that down. So what are the, what are the components of trust that we need to talk about? Uh, one is going to be saying taking ownership. So taking ownership of the things that I do and being responsible for my contribution to any project, as opposed to uh, blaming conditions, blaming the environment, blaming resources, or blaming other people. So trust fundamentally is about you knowing that if I drop the ball, I'm going to take it, I'm going to acknowledge it. Okay. And then you, if you know I can acknowledge it and take ownership of it, then you, you know, our, our working relationship tree is going to be is going to be much stronger than if I just blame it on somebody else or if I blame it on a situation. And so what we would do is we would structure a conversation around what does ownership look like. What does ownership look like? And out of that conversation, we'll ask participants to make a make a commitment on how they are going to enact that new behavior, that, that concept in their daily life. And uh, a model, one of the models we use for, for habits or habit design is through BJ Fogg. And his angle is, you know, make it small, make it so small that it's easy and then connect it to an existing habit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we, we walk our participants through that process and then we give them a piece of technology and a, and a, um, and a model that is designed to reinforce this habit. So a couple things that help. One, if you reflect on your habit a few times a week, so two to three times a week, if you just pause and say, how am I doing on this? And scale yourself one to 10. If you take a, a moment to reflect and say, 
you know, I, I'm not remembering to do this, or I, you know, I, I did, I was successful in this case, but not in that case. And then make a, maybe make a journal entry. If you have an accountability buddy, someone that reflects with you, you know, maybe twice a week to say, hey, I notice you're doing this, or hey, I want to encourage you. And then if you, re if you come back to the group, that, you, that you're going through this with and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is how I've done. All of those things are going to lend to a new behavior pattern. Yeah. And we know that behavior patterns typically take uh, three to six weeks to establish. Yeah, yeah, I've heard the 21 day rule on, on behavior. 21 day rule. So we focus on about 30 days. So 28 to 30, depending on, you know, give or take. And, and that typically allows us enough time to cement a new behavior. And then we'll move, we'll move on to the next one. And so change, change is scary, but change doesn't happen without change. You can't have change without change. And people are very resistant to change. So what we wanna do is we wanna do it in digestible doses and allow it to be the participant's um, development. So if you're part of an organization and everybody's talking about how do we, how do we improve trust, I have to take a, I have to take a, a moment to reflect, well, what can I contribute here? Maybe I'm the most trustworthy person on the team, possibly. Let's just assume that. How can I get better? We can always get better. Right. Or maybe, maybe I have the most room for opportunity to improve. And this is now a decision-making factor. Like, do I want to build trust with this team? Or maybe is it time to celebrate a separation and, and, and to find a team that I'm ready to build trust on? Yeah, yeah. It's a great point. You know, when I was thinking about one of the challenges that I hear a lot from my clients who are typically HR leaders is I want managers to give, people are asking for feedback. I want managers and employees to talk more often, do more check-ins on a weekly or, or bi-weekly basis. Um, and I want uh, managers to give essential feedback and appreciate their employees and also give critical feedback and, you know, improvement feedback, if you will. Um, that's a behavior change for many people, uh, especially if you're a first-time manager. And we have a lot of first-time managers, especially with the turnover we have, that we've have seen in the workforce. Um, what What are your you know recommendations for something doing something like that at scale? If you're an HR leader, like how do you go about doing something like that? Well, that's a performance that's a performance management system. Okay, okay. and typically performance evaluations are done annually, which that was a best practice but it's no longer really a best practice. Right, exactly. So now the new best practice is quarterly, like, like the industry standard. And so um, I think you really need to ask yourself, okay, well, what, what is the space you're in and what is an appropriate cycle to evaluate managers performance or to evaluate a, um, a staff or technical, you know, a technical you know, experts practice? What's, what is a, a reasonable cycle? And that may change. So if you have somebody new in the role, new with the organization, or new developing the skill, you may want a, a shorter, faster cycle. It's going to take more time. Where if you, if you have somebody that is more senior, practice, been around a long time, and you have confidence, maybe the cycle goes a little, a little bit bigger. Um, but that cycle, that performance evaluation cycle is critical. Number two, how is that being conducted? How is it being kept objective rather than subjective? And how is it being, I, um, so this is where I get into what we call mastering the, the human and business conversation. So from a manager's perspective, you've got to be able to, to understand the needs of the business and you have to master being human and connecting humanly to your direct reports. Yes. And that is, that is the challenge of the day. So some people are really good at connecting humanly, but not necessarily good at, 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 at achieving business outcomes. Others are really good at focusing on the business outcomes, but not necessarily really good at connecting hum humanly right. um, with, with their direct reports. And so we need to be really good at both of those. And for me, and the way our approach is, one, we have to know the individual. We have to know what they are, um, their aspirations are. What is it they want to achieve? How come this role is a good fit for them right now? And, and sometimes they don't know. That's fine. They're on the journey, okay? But sometimes people know, hey, I want to go and become X. So I want to, I want to start my own business. I want to open my own marketing firm one day. And that's why I joined this marketing agency, because I want to start my own marketing firm. 
uh, my own agency and I joined this one because I like the culture, I like the work you're doing, I like the client, the kind of clients you serve, and this will allow me to develop my skills. Excellent. So let's evaluate your performance around our business needs and your individual development needs. Right. Let's right. tie those together. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it, it makes total sense. In fact, I'm, I'm actually working on a book uh, based on the Ikigai concept, uh, which one of the things that I, oh, not one of the things, the main thing that I'm focusing on is how do you tie the business goals to employees' interests and what they're really good at? You know, that's, to me, that's the epicenter of success for everyone. And that is our, that's our philosophical approach. As often as we can do that, we do. Um, and sometimes, you know, the way I look at it is sometimes, sometimes people are in a job because they need a paycheck. Right. And, and you, you just got to acknowledge that. And, and maybe that's what it you're is. You're going to acknowledge that. You're going to acknowledge that. And you're going to say, hey, this, well, okay, we're going to keep giving you a paycheck, but here's what we need from you. It's an agreement. So that's another big, uh, a big thing we talk about is building and keeping agreements as opposed to managing expectations. So let's eliminate the idea of expectations. Um, we, use, we use expectation, meets expectations, exceeds expectations in the people space. All ex, it's all about expectations, right? And uh, we proactively work to remove that language and to have agreements. So if I am managing someone and I say, okay, here's, here's the role. Okay, this is here's the responsibilities and the duties day to day. Um, and here's your compensation package. We're going to treat this as an agreement. You're agreeing to do these things, and we're agreeing to give you these things in consideration for your time, energy, effort, talent, and ability. Well, that's a that's a big agreement, right? That's really one massive agreement. But maybe we need to, in a in a performance evaluation conversation. We need to come to an agreement, uh, or I'm, I'm saying, I come to you, Sri, and you, you're working on our team. Uh, maybe you're doing some code, and uh, we just realize that someone else on the team um, has, has COVID and can't work. And I'm saying, okay, uh, Sri, I know you've been working over here on this. I need you to step in and pick up um, Joe's section of the code, and then that needs to be done by Tuesday. Can you agree to do that for us? And you sit back and you think you realize the, pro you, you, you process it, right? And you're like, I can get 80% of it done, but there's this one component that Joe's really good at that I'm not. Let's ask, you know, Susan, I think she can do this section really well. Fantastic. Or we might just say, you do the 80, I'll figure out how to get that other component done. Now I have an agreement with you. So Tuesday comes and you say, I don't have it. And then now we're like, okay, what happened? We, we had an agreement. It's no longer about you meeting or exceeding expectation. It's about whether you can keep agreements. And for folks on my team, if we can't build and keep an agreement, then we're not the right partners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer about your behavior or your performance, but it's more now about your ability to create an agreement. That's a great Because point. you've weighed in. You've weighed in. I'm not putting something on you that you're not delivering on. I've got your vested input into what you actually could do and then whether it was successful or failed, you know. So uh, building and keeping agreements is I think critical in this new, uh, new phase of managing people. Yeah, and I think that's probably the biggest thing that a manager can learn from because the tendency of a new manager who has not been exposed to or mentor to be a manager or coach to be a manager, or maybe it's not a naturally, I don't know if there's anything such, such, such as natural abilities to be a manager, but let's say they're not naturally inclined towards it. Their, their expectations are that I need to satisfy my management. So let me see how much work I can get done with my team. So I look good to my management, right? Or like you said, oh, they're very people centric. They were working with friends and now they're managing their friends. And now they're like being more human centric and forgetting that there's a business objective to be achieved as well. So either way, it the, doesn't benefit the organization. You know, we had a, a back, back in the day, I was in consulting for a big four company and we had these people, managers uh, and consultant, you know, consulting managers who were known to get stuff done. They were like, if you want to get stuff done, give it to this person, but, you'll have, but they will leave some dead bodies in their wake. 
Um, and that basically meant that they would burn out people. <laughs> They'll get stuff done. The client will be happy, but then five people are going to quit. You know, and yeah. that's... And the, the other thing is we have to realize that, you know, we're talking in a, we're talking in a podcast conversation, right? You know, essentially a very sterile lab. Um, when you're out there and you have uh, three, four hundred, a thousand people that are looking to you for leadership um, and you have operations going on or you're doing multiple projects and on the ground, there's issues with the client, there are issues with the customer or issues with the server. Like there's stuff that's going to go on right that you cannot you're never going to handle like you, like you would in a laboratory right that's just the reality exactly. but if you have built in the value system right if we you know we haven't talked about values but if you've built in the value system you've built in the the trust and and you and you understand how to create an agreement well you can be adaptive you can adapt to the situation and get done what needs to get done and so I, I want to, I, I guess I want to frame what I'm saying is as I recognize some of these where things we're talking about is kind of in, in, in an ideal scenario, but we don't always live in an ideal scenario. That's so exactly it's, right. a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's embedding it into the culture so that when, when there's a crisis, it's already kind of second nature and comes through muscle memory, a behavioral response. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Greg, I really appreciate your time. I do have a couple of final questions um, and the insight. I mean, this has been a very interesting conversation. And a lot of these things you read about, but the way you you put it together, you phrased it, makes a lot of sense. I've not heard these some of these phrasings and uh, the analogies and the, and, the, and the type of perspective and the way to look at things uh, before. So I really appreciate that. And, and, and I read a lot. So... I'm sure this is uh, going to be very insightful for a lot of our listeners as well. Uh, but like the couple of questions I have, you know, one, uh, it's not leadership, you know, what, and from your perspective, you know, what, how do you describe your leadership style? And then what is that one leader that you really admire? Um, I think my leadership style. So there's two questions to that. One is, it's somewhat situational um, because when, when the chips are down and when things are intense and things got to get done, I think we need a different form of leadership than when, hey, the grass is green and everybody is healthy and things are going well. So um, I, I think in some way, depending on the environment and the conditions, you know, we can approach leadership in a slightly different way. Uh, regardless of that, kind of overlaying that is I take the VAE approach, so vision, alignment, execution. So getting very, very clear on what we want as an outcome. And so the clearer I can be on what, we, what, what my team needs as an outcome, um, I think that clarity you know, adds a lot uh, of value. And then two, values. So what are the values that guide us? And so if I'm able to articulate very clearly the picture of where we wanna go and where we need to be, and if I've done well at conveying our values and I've chosen people, uh, that align with those values, then I can get my hands, I can get out of the way. I really can get out of the way at that point and say, go. Um, and so that, that's, that to me is the ideal kind of frame of leadership that I take is create that future picture, um, put the values in place and let, let lieutenants, directors and, and team actually get the ball down the field. Excellent. And what's the one leader that you admire or maybe more than one? Um, wow. Um, there's a number of them. Maybe somewhat controversial. And, and for a number of reasons, so I'm going to mention Elon, Elon Musk here for a second. Uh, now, I don't know that he's an effective manager, like the way he, he runs his organization. And so I'm not going to speak to that. But from a sense of casting vision for society and, and, and getting like actual concrete movement, you know, between SpaceX and Tesla. Um, and now you've got Starlink. The kinds of things he's done has led our society in a way, you know, that it's just, it's, it's impressive. Um, again, caveat, I don't know exactly how he manages his people. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, I, 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 a, 
Yes, I completely agree. In fact, I wrote an article a couple of years ago on LinkedIn. This is before the pandemic on, on um, how the Tesla's performance management system was completely screwed up. Um, and I was like, Elon Musk may be a great visionary, but his performance management system and approach is not. <laughs> but that being said, I will argue all day that to me today, as we stand, he has been a more successful visionary than Steve Jobs has been. Um, and no disrespect that obviously to either one of them, you know, he was like the icon for years, but the amount of progress he has done for humanity and some other things that were um, earlier thought almost impossible because people with a lot bigger budgets, a lot bigger infrastructure could not pull off and that he could pull off. Um, as, it's just, uh, I, I, I think that needs to be um, acknowledged. Yeah. And another one I'll mention, uh, again, potentially controversial, but this was not our contemporary, um, uh, George Washington. And uh, the reason I would acknowledge him is because he had the chance, he had the opportunity of having of power thrust on him, and he laid it down. And uh, he essentially created the, the idea and the concept of a, of a short-term president. Yeah, I, wish I think that takes that takes it that takes a level of character that um, one we don't see and two there's not many opportunities for, and so I, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for that. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Greg. I really appreciate it. Um, this was the uh, People Leaders, uh, People Strategy Leaders podcast, and thank you again for joining us. Uh, my pleasure, Sri. Thank you. Shri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders Podcast. If you are a successful leader or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content. To make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sri Chalapa. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. And thank you to Patrick Ramsey, sound engineer at Kalinga Production Studios, for recording and mixing this show.